I am really excited to be here uh, because I love talking about this subject. I love talking about diversity and inclusion. And more specifically, I love talking about diversity and inclusion as a strategic advantage. Uh, I'm not an HR guy. I like to, to confess that up front. I'm a business guy. My background is in information technology and operational excellence. If you know what that means, please let me know. Uh, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that this is the right thing to do. Sure, it's the right thing to do. We all know it's the right thing to do. But we don't always do the right thing, now do we? If we all did the right thing all the time, we'd live in nirvana. There would be no hunger or poverty or war. But that's not reality. As employers, we have thousands of competing priorities, um, the most important of which is ensuring that we continue to be employers by managing the bottom line. It's not that I don't care. Of course I care. I'm a human being. I have a heart. But I'm also a realist. I recognize that caring isn't always enough to inspire some people to take action. So what is the business case for diversity and inclusion, or DNI, as I may refer to it? I am here to tell you that there is a very hard and fast business case that should inspire any employer in Canada to take action, regardless of your industry, sector, or size. There are two factors that are all you need to look at to understand the business case for DNI. At the Canadian Institute of Diversity and Inclusion, we believe that every employer needs to understand their business case for DNI before they ever move to action. If you can't articulate the business case clearly and succinctly, your initiatives will inevitably fail. We believe this so much that next week we'll be releasing a report and working template that we call the ironclad business case, business case for DNI. It was built based on the input of hundreds of employers from across Canada, some of which are here today. And we are confident that it will provide a solid foundation on which employers can build. It'll be available for free on our website at diversityrocks.ca. I thought I would start with some cold hard facts about those two groups that I mentioned earlier. I'm then going to spend some time uh, providing some tips, some things you can take away um, and do yourself to help improve the inclusiveness of your workplace. So let's start with the first group, people. We all need people. Regardless of what business you're in, you need people. Bow Valley College and Mount Royal University need people to teach their students and to run their schools. Alberta Health Services and the Government of Alberta, Calgary Police Service need people to ensure that the province of Alberta continues to be a great place to live. Enbridge and Husky Energy can't extract and move oil and gas without people. WestJet can't fly without people. We all need people. More importantly, we need people who care about what they do. If the good people at WestJet didn't take pride in their work, I might be giving this speech in Goose Bay, Newfoundland, which would be wrong on several reasons. <laughs> Countless studies have shown that people who are engaged in their work and are more productive leads to higher profitability and efficiency. We all say that we want to attract the, and retain the best and brightest, right? We all say that. But do we really? Let's talk to statistics. I worked for accountants for the better part of a decade. I've become very comfortable around numbers. It's like a little blanket. So we all know that women receive a large majority of undergraduate degrees in Canada. It's about 60%. But does anyone know the year that that started? 1980. In the 1979-1980 school year, 34 years ago, 54% uh, of undergraduate degrees went to women and has not dropped below 50% since then. 
So if your leadership isn't 50% women, can you really say that you have been successful in attracting and retaining the best and the brightest? Or have you been successful at attracting and retaining the ones that survive? According to the 2006 census, just over 22% of Calgarians uh, identify as quote unquote visible minority, which is of course a person who is uh, non-Caucasian in ethnicity or non-white in color, and I hate the term, which is why I put it in quotes. Um, anyone know what that number was in the 2011 National Household Survey? Just over 30%. So if that trajectory continues, Calgary will be 50% or more visible minority in less than 15 years. Now look around at your middle management and tell me if 30% of them are visible minorities. And why not? Since I already know the answer. One in five Canadians will suffer from a mental illness in their lifetime and 80% of those people will not receive proper treatment. Can you say that you know how you would react if one of your team was exhibiting signs of mental illness? And better still, would you know how to ensure that that person continued to be a productive member of your team while addressing their mental health issues? Speaking of pe people with disabilities, 20% of Canadians live with a disability of some kind. Is that a large enough constituency that you're willing to miss out on as a potential talent pool? Are you confident that your workplace is barrier free? The biggest argument against hiring people with disabilities is the cost of accommodation. Well, I'm here to tell you that everything is an accommodation. The lights are an accommodation for sighted people. I used to work with a woman who was blind and, and she would always somewhat joke that if the lights went out, she could keep working. And what the hell was my problem? <laughs> Everything is an accommodation, sometimes for the majority and sometimes for the minority. More importantly, studies have shown that the average cost of an accommodation for a person with a disability is less than $500 once. The potential savings and benefits, priceless. Trademark MasterCard. The Aboriginal and Indigenous population is the fastest growing demographic in this country, increasing by about 5% per year, whereas the non-Aboriginal population is growing by less than 1% per year. Indigenous people now make up 4.3% of the Canadian population, and in fact, 5.8% of Alberta's citizens. Without a doubt, they are one of the most important sources of talent in Canada going forward. So do they need to adapt to us or we to them? Immigrants, newcomers. I am an immigrant. I'm an eighth generation Canadian. But I am from around these parts. I'm a British mutt, of course. English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh means that I drink like a fish and I will eat anything on a dare but I am still an immigrant. Canada brings in a quarter million people into this country every year. In 1914, the top three countries of source of immigrants were England, Ireland, and France. Today, the top three countries are China, India, and the Philippines. When 30 to 50% of your job applicants don't have English or French as a first language, is that their problem or our problem? The Indian Institute of Technology is one of the hardest post-secondary uh, institutions in the world to get into, and even harder still to get out of. But do your hiring managers understand that an engineering degree from IIT is actually somewhat better than the same degree from the University of Calgary? No offense to the University of Calgary. I'm not pointing these out to, to be provocative, maybe a little provocative. I'm raising these points because they're fact. These are statistical facts that cannot be avoided. So what about the second group, the customer? 
we all have a customer in some way, shape, or form. Public sector, private sector, for-profit, not-for-profit, academia, healthcare, the city of Calgary. We all have a customer. So who are they? What do they look like? What are their needs? And do you know how to meet those needs? Do you understand your customer? We talk about the BRIC countries all the time. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. None of them have English as a first language. So if you're looking to do business in Russia, how are you going to communicate with your customer? If you set up operations in Brazil, and the guy you send to run the show speaks Spanish, and you think that they speak Spanish in Brazil, <laughs> it's probably not going to go well. If you have an office in Beijing, and you send Bob to take over as the CEO, Bob speaks fluent Mandarin. He's Asian. Well, what if Bob's last name was Sugiyami, and he's Japanese? Do you have any idea how disastrously bad that is going to go? I'll tell you a little story. Um, I know a woman who worked for a large technology organization, and, and she took on a global role in the company. And uh, for her first trip, she went to Japan. Um, and she went to her hotel. She checked in. Uh, bellhop took her bags up to the room, stood at the door, and bowed. And she thought, okay, when in Japan, eat the sushi. So she bowed. And then he bowed. And she bowed. Mm -hmm. And he bowed. And, she, and they just kept getting lower and lower. She snapped in half. <laughs> and eventually, she just closed the door. Well, what she didn't realize is that Japan is a very hierarchical country, and that tradition says that the person at the bottom of the hierarchy should bow last and bow deepest. Simplest thing in the world that she didn't understand. Here's another tidbit for you. Did you know that women are responsible for 80% of the household spend? Not in my house. That's my husband's job. So why is there a woman in a bikini in your advertising? Unless you're selling products related to penis enlargement? What do women in bikinis have to do with cars? The LGBT community, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans-identified community has an annual household spending power of about $80 billion in Canada. Anyone think that's a market share that's not worth courting? Here's the business case for diversity and inclusion in one simple sentence. Your people and your customers. Technically not really a sentence, but I think you get my point. Now here's a news flash for my straight, white, able-bodied brothers in the room. This isn't about you losing so everyone else can win. You know why? Because straight, white, able-bodied men are people too. Not good people, <laughs> but people. Seriously though, when you think about the definition of the word diversity, it means different. It doesn't mean different from. As such, straight, white, able-bodied men are just as diverse as everyone else. So there's your first lesson in how to be successful with a diversity and inclusion strategy. Include everyone. You cannot claim to prioritize diversity and inclusion and then not include someone. It doesn't work like that. It is imperative that you include everyone in this conversation. And that is even more true when it comes to straight, white, able-bodied men. Not only should they be considered diverse, but there are also a lot of them in positions of influence. If they feel like they're not included by, within a DNI strategy, there's a good chance that they'll throw a wrench in the machine. Here's your second lesson. Show of hands, how many people would say that they treat everyone the same, that you treat people equally? Nobody. Good. 
Why would you treat everyone the same? I know this is going to be surprising. I do not have a womb. Yes, that's a joke. Seriously, was anybody actually surprised by that? I mention this because why would you treat me the same as my female counterparts? Um, that's not to say that women need to be treated differently in order to achieve the same as men. That's, that's far from it. Uh, but I'll let you in on just a tiny bit of a secret. Women make babies. Yes, men are part of the process, but let's face it, it's like two minutes. <laughs> women are in it for the long haul. Lesson number two, don't treat everyone the same. Childbirth has an impact on a woman's career progression. I get in a lot of trouble for saying this, but it's the truth. If a woman chooses and is able to have a child biologically, it may affect her career track. Won't necessarily, but it might. And that's not a bad thing. It comes down to simple people management. Treat every person as an individual. Examine their needs. What do they need to be successful? Take care of your people and they will take care of you. And to be clear, that may mean doing something like creating a, a leadership development program specifically targets women. Again, if you want to retain the best and the brightest and 50% of the workforce is female and you're losing those women at a higher rate, you may want to do something special to retain them. It's just good people management. It's not about special treatment. It's a good business decision. Oh, and for the men in the room who think that uh, women get it so easy when it comes to childbirth, they get a year off, isn't that lovely, I would encourage you to push a watermelon through your nose <laughs> and then tell me if you need a couple days off. <laughs> My sister uh, gave uh, birth to a, a baby uh, about a year ago. Uh, she was in labor for 22 hours. She pushed an eight pound creature out of her body with no pain medication. The day I found out she was pregnant, I got an epidural. I have not felt anything from the waist down since. <laughs> and that's just gender. There are enormous differences related to culture and learning style and ability. The list goes on. Your goal as an employer should be to create a workplace where people can do their best work. If you do that, your organization will succeed. Don't treat everyone the same. Lesson number three, change will not happen magically. For everyone who thinks that change will just take time, it just takes time. Women have received the majority undergraduate degrees for over 30 years, that they only make up less than 15% of the CEOs of FP1000 companies. How much time do we need? We cannot simply sit around and expect the change to happen. There's an old saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. We need deliberate action. We need a plan. We need goals and accountability. We need measurement. This is all outlined in our report. Again, you can get it at diversityrocks.ca. They make me put that in. I've made the comparison to this um, to say, imagine if you were like Pepsi or Coke or, um, and you decided to launch a product into the market. You had no plan, you had no measurement, and no accountability. Just imagine how successful that would be. Let's just, yeah, new chocolate bar. We're just going to throw it out there, see what happens. I'm thinking no. Successful D&I initiatives involve a solid business case and a plan of action or strategy and succinct measurement and accountability. I'm going to tell you one last story and it, it, one last lesson. It wasn't, it's not in my notes, so I'm off book right now. This is where it gets really dangerous, particularly with the camera. The fourth lesson is think. We, as a society, as human beings tend to live quite mindlessly. And there's lots of reasons why we do that. But we don't think. We just do things naturally. 
so today, as I was landing, I came into Calgary Airport. I uh, went into the Max, you know, by the, everybody knows it. Um, I got a bottle of water, I go up to the cash, and there's a sign. Now the sign, the intention of the sign, I will say, is to say to people, if you are under a certain age, you're going to get carded if you want to buy cigarettes. Right? So this is what the sign says. It's a picture of a 50-something white man in a sweater vest. He's a good-looking guy. And I'm really sorry if you actually created this ad and you're in the room. It says, this is Ralph. If you don't look like Ralph, expect to get carded. <laughs> oh, awkward. So if you're a woman, if you're not Caucasian, if you don't wear sweater vests, <laughs> expect to get carded. I bought some cigarettes. He didn't card me. The point is you have to think. Yes, that was the joke. I'm a middle-aged man. Another, another uh, tale of woe, an airline not based here, National Canadian Air, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I won't say it out of fear that they or somewhere. Uh, they had a series of ads last year. There were all these gorgeous people. You probably saw them. They were, you know, walking places for no apparent reason. And say Rome or Paris, New York. They were all gorgeous. They were all white. And I looked at the ads and went, okay, so apparently only white people who are really good looking, which I took issue with. Because I fly that airline, and that is not who is on those planes. <laughs> but what's the message? So here's to the person who put that ad up about Ralph. What if it was Ralph and three of his friends? Two of them were women and two people were not Caucasian. All I want to do is see myself in that ad. And I go, OK, maybe I don't look like that, so I might expect to get carded if I smoked. But you have to think. You have to look at the advertisements. You have to look at your policies, your programs, and you have to think. You have to say, is this discriminatory in some way? Does this exclude someone? So there you have it, four lessons. Include everyone. Don't treat everyone the same. Be deliberate and think. If you follow these steps, you'll be successful with the implementation and execution of a strategy focused on diversity and inclusion. And inevitably, you will be successful at whatever you do. Thank you very much.